As I said, today's uh, freelance legend is Nina Hendy. Nina is a well-known uh, freelance business journalist whose work is often seen, amongst others, in The Age, The Sydney Morning Herald, and uh, The Financial Review. Her list of clients is a, is a who's who of the Australian corporate landscape, including Westpac, Vodafone, CBA, Australia Post, NAB, Census, Officeworks, and a whole host of leading startups and, and smaller businesses as well. Nina is also founder of the Freelance Collective, and I will let Nina talk uh, about that uh, herself in a little bit more detail lately. But it's, uh, uh, it's an online platform and a community of Australia's best creative freelancers. Um, and uh, as I said, I'll let Nina uh, put some, some meat on the bone around that a, a little bit later on. And if that wasn't enough, uh, Nina has been a great friend and supporter of Rounded since day one. And in fact, she probably doesn't know this, but when I joined Rounded in February of 2016, Nina was actually my first phone call and the first person that I spoke to in my brand new role. Uh, and we had a chat about collaboration ideas and partnership opportunities. And she told me in no uncertain terms, we're happy to promote Rounded, but I will not be happy if next week I see your banner ads on Upwork. So she gave me notice <laughs> there and then. Um, so, so Nina, on that note, welcome to the webinar this afternoon and thank you for taking the time to join us. Uh, thank you very much. So let's start off maybe for those people who, who aren't familiar with your work. Tell us a little bit about your career and, and how you've got to, to this point. Sure. Uh, always wanted to be a journalist, started off in newspapers, um, did all of the, the regional newspaper jobs that you do as a young cadet, so uh, learnt on the job, writing lots and lots of stories a day, um, really good grounding, lots of really great editors um, over the years, really enjoyed it, um, then moved into a business magazine that I was writing for in Melbourne, um, so still in print and really enjoyed that was writing about media and marketing and um and that was really great work and discovered freelancing there and just fell in love with it it was sort of everything i've ever wanted out of journalism to be able to realize that i could um write for lots of different people uh you know particularly on one topic so i started sort of writing travel and and features for b2b magazines and um built up my freelancing and during the gfc sort of had a good stable um, number of clients um, and moved into freelancing. So I've been freelancing now full time for 10 years. I was in house for about 10 or 15 years before that um, in newspapers. So professionally trained and it was a real leap of faith to go freelance still, even though I was felt reasonably established and confident. Um, but I did. I got a call from an editor at the Sydney Morning Herald asking if I could write weekly for them the following week. Once they heard I was, you know, for the media and marketing pages. Once they heard I was out by my own, and that was my dream role. So it really grew from there. Um, and I've been doing this now for ten years this year, and absolutely love it. Ten years! Congratulations. Thanks. Awesome. And. Yeah. Obviously, there's two aspects to the work that you do. One is your sort of traditional freelance journalism business. Yes. Uh, and the other is, is the Freelance Collective, which was an idea that you had a few years ago. So tell yes. us about that. So I got, I got, you know, kind of freelancing and writing for different publications. And um, I just kept seeing all these websites pop up, saying, sort of purporting to be the next big thing for freelancers and you know, we're going to make it so easy for you to get lots of work. And, you know, it, it just, I didn't ever really, you know, sign up for them, particularly I'm, I'm presuming everyone knows the sites I'm talking about. But I, I heard a lot about it from other colleagues and it really annoyed me that they were trying to commoditize freelancers and trying to take a cut for matching freelancers with work. So, you know, I'd sort of been in this industry for a pretty long time and I'd had signed up to some of the content factory sort of sites and you know the, the rates were just terrific they were really low and I just got really frustrated and I couldn't stop thinking about you know how do you how do we turn it and flip it and make it so that the freelancers are promoting themselves um, and the clients actually come to us and find really great talent that they work they want to work with um, you know that 
that and then and then no longer is it about um, the clients kind of driving that relationship. It's more about the clients finding the freelancer that's right for the work. Um, so we're sort of reversing that model. Um, and every freelancer that's on the site is known to us. We check all their credentials before we make them live. And it allows clients to just come, find the freelancer they want to work with and have a closer working relationship with them. They've actually got a surname. Um, you build the relationship off the site. And, um, you know, there's a lot of these agencies and, and um, services out there that are kind of like a, a wall between you and your client. And it, it was about removing that wall and actually working directly with your ideal clients. So, um, you know, you're getting paid better and um, you're getting found by clients that you may never have known that needed your services, but they see you writing, you know, particularly architecture or they see you, you know, you're based in a certain city and they want to work with you because of your skills. So um, it's great. It's 15 bucks a month to join. Um, and as long as you're, you know, great at what you do and you're established and you're Australian, you can join. Okay. So it's, it's for Australian freelancers and, and for obviously, a, a, as you say, a, a membership uh, community. Yes. Um, and, and what sort of more specifically, if you're a, if you're a freelancer, uh, you know, and, and interested in the freelance sort of the, the freelance collective, what are the sort of the top things or the things that your community tell you that they get from being a member of the freelance collective? Okay, so just to point out that it's journalists and editors and web developers and graphic designers and copywriters and bloggers and all sorts of different types of freelancers um, that are in that creative space. And we've got a community, so we all talk to each other in there and we support each other, we share jobs. Um, sometimes clients search our platform and they're not quite sure who they want to work with. So we actually reach out to the freelancers and say, you know, here's the opportunity. Is anyone interested particularly in this? And then we shortlist those and send them directly to the client. So the client's getting, you know, say three great copywriters for a particular brief. They're, they're already written in the retail space a lot or whatever it might be. So so the freelancers are getting that, you know, they're getting jobs sent to them specifically. They're also getting found. Um, it's like a vetted LinkedIn, I guess. So they're getting found by clients that they'd never even considered approaching. And they're getting support. You know, we, we can jump into our little community and um, we can, you know, just vent or share really bad days that we've had. Um, a lot of us are working independently. Um, so it's really about supporting each other as well on that journey and it just sometimes it does get a bit lonely being you know a freelancer so it it mitigates that and it, it actually makes it um you know you've got a community that you can turn to um we're having christmas drinks again this year all over the country so you've got some face-to-face -face contact as well which is great fantastic so it sounds obviously multifaceted uh, support network uh, business development exposure uh, yeah. Lots of different types of things, which sounds a, a bargain for, for $15 a month. But of course, the main point of this webinar is to, uh, for Nino, is obviously sharing your insights about how we've pitched it, is, is raising the bar. Mm -hmm. um, and how you as a freelancer can, uh, I guess, be a better freelancer and, and really focusing on getting better quality work, uh, charging a higher rate, all of, all of those things. Uh, that freelancers aspire to. Mm. So um, I guess, uh, you know, there, there's obviously, as we know, there's, there's lots of different types of freelancers. And, and Nina, one of, you know, one of the things that you said to me is, is there are freelancers and there are freelancers. Mm. Um, you know, so, so what do you mean by that to start with? Yeah, well, there's a big difference in freelancers that are just earning a bit on the side. Um, and those are sort of maybe hiring other freelancers and operating more like a small business. So there's a lot um, of, you know, freelancers that are just doing it for a couple of days a week or, um, you know, they've got their a full-time job and they just want to earn a bit on the side offering their skills and that's great. Um, it's, it's amazing that this um, style of work allows people to be able to do that. Um, there's a, there are other freelancers, however, that are actually, you know, really kind of um, operating, as I said, like a small business and, um, you know, they're... They're um, landing really great clients. Um, they've, they've got great projects and they're working sort of ongoing retainer work with really great brands and that sort of thing. And these freelancers have often made the mistakes that we've all had to make along the way and they've undercharged more than once, but they've learnt from it. 
and they've pulled the all-nighters that we've all had to pull to meet a deadline because we underquoted on or underestimated the amount of work. Um, you know, these freelancers are sort of dictating their own rates. They're not being told what um, the you know what the fee is by the client, um, and they're working with really great small businesses and universities and entrepreneurs and big banks and overseas clients and those sorts of things. So they're quoting on each project that comes in. Um, and it might be a, a month project or a three month project or a retainer or um, they're not just sort of take, randomly taking on one job after the next as they come in. They're a bit more strategic um, and they're bypassing that middleman I was talking about earlier. So those sites that, um, you know, kind of commoditize what we do, they're, they're not doing that. They're, they're more like working directly with the client. Um, often they're turning over big bucks too. They're, um, outsourcing elements of the project, um, you know, to other freelancers to bring a better service to the client. So they might be quoting, I mean, one of the freelancers in our community, you know, he's mostly, you know, $80,000 for a project and there might be quite a few pair of hands on that project. So, you know, there are a lot bigger kind of operators in, in that way. And sometimes they don't even call themselves freelancers. They might say we on their website or um, try and look a bit bigger than they really are. Um, they're still, however, operating essentially in the same way as a freelancer. Um, and um, they've got more of a more small business mentality, though, and they're very, you know, strategic about what they do. And, and you've touched on a point there, because that was going to be my, my next question is, is, you know, obviously there are some freelancers that, that, that are happy with their work being a side gig or, or, or just something that they can do part time and gives them flexibility that there are some. That, that want to really, uh, you know, get get to that to that next level. But you know, what are some of the practical differences that you see in in those with those freelancers who sort of are running, you know, a very high value, well known business versus those people that are still sort of perhaps feel like they're running into the wind and, and not getting there, uh, you know, as quickly or not maybe achieving uh, yeah. you know, quite the level that they want to with their business. Yeah. I think some people I've seen over the years have tried freelancing and it's just they've accepted it's just not for them. I think, um, you know, you've got to be a certain type of person and sometimes you don't realise that it's not your cup of tea until you've tried it. Um, it's something we discuss a lot in our community and I hear over and over again it's not just one thing that you can, you know, that you have to do to take your freelance career to that next level. You've got to be really dedicated, you've got to really love it and be really driven. Um, you don't necessarily have to work massive hours once you've got a lot, you know, got yourself established. Um, you've got to, I find really you've got to be an optimist. You've really got to believe um, in yourself, which can be difficult sometimes when you don't have um, others around you. Uh, so you've really got to create great branding as well and stand for something that you believe in rather than looking around at what everyone else is doing and worrying about, you know, how you look compared to their website or any of that. Just stand for something that you really believe in within your business and live and breathe it is my best advice. Like, you know, it's certainly, you certainly should pivot and change if you see an opportunity. But, and, but make sure your branding actually um, shows that you're now doing this or you've really got to be updating your branding and your website and your LinkedIn profile and your freelance collective profile and all those things so that when others are looking at what you do, um, they already know whether or not they want to work with you because they've read about you online and they come to you and they just hire you. You, you get to that stage where they're not asking for samples of your work or they're not necessarily, you know, checking on a phone call whether or not you're the one they, they want to hire. They've already made their decision because They've read about you online. You're really putting your best foot forward um, on social media and those sorts of things. And then you can just focus on what you do. Um, and you've got to, to, as you were asking about your career to the next level, you've got to give your best on every single project. Um, my, I remember a newspaper editor said to me once, you're only as good as your last story. And that's always stayed with me. And I think a, a lot of us... Um, really live and breathe that as well you you know if you stuff up the last project you really you've got to keep going until it's perfect even if that means um you know you've you've 
you're not earning for a bit of the time that you're working on the project. It's not about that. It's about your reputation and then learning from it and diff quoting differently next time and that sort of thing so that you are getting paid the right dollar amount, you know, per hour for what you're doing. So those are the kind of things you need to think about. Just believe in what you do and stand for something on your, in your branding. Don't try and be everything um, and just live and breathe that. Awesome. So I think you, you made a point there and I'd like to, I'd like to sort of dive into that a, a, a little bit in, in, uh, in terms of branding. Now, if you are somebody that, that is across freelance forums or discussions, you'll know that personal branding is always one of those hot topics that yeah. some people love and dive into. Some people are, are quite intimidated by the whole uh, prospect of it. But again, if we could perhaps take that to a practical application, talk about, perhaps give us some insight if you can about a client decision-making process, okay? They, they may be looking for somebody on the freelance collective, right? And you've got somebody who has done all of those things versus somebody that may not have done them so well. Uh, you know, c can you give us some insight into how a yes. personal brand or the way that you display, uh, you know, what you're good at and what you do oh help yep. somebody make a decision if they don't know you? Yeah, um, samples of your work is a really important one. Um, getting into your website, your LinkedIn and your freelance collective profile, if you've got one, and just updating it and, and making sure there's lots of recent samples. Don't talk about who you are outside of work. No one cares if you're a skateboarder or a mother. You know, they just want to... I really mean that. I, I see so many freelancers kind of try and tell their life story. It's just, it's, I don't think clients want to know that stuff. I really feel as though they want to see who you've worked with before. Some great testimonials is really important, making sure you update those um, and um, putting your best foot forward online because if you work from home like I do, I go um, interstate for work a few times a year, um, but they're making the decisions on whether or not to hire me for those projects based on what they see online. So, you know, regularly updating them is a really important part of that. You know, if you look at if you look at your profile and ask yourself, would I hire me based on the information that I see? Exactly. Right? If the answer is well, maybe not. If it's not like a solid yes, mm -hmm. then there's probably some work that needs to be done there. How important is it to be able to say no? It's really important. Sometimes you. Um, get an inquiry from a new client or you jump on a call with them and you just get this gut feeling um, that they're just not the right fit for you. And accepting that and getting to a stage in your earnings and your career that you can recognise it and say, um, look, I'm going to refer you to someone else. And having that network is really important because they feel, you don't want them to feel rejected. You just want to point out perhaps that there's someone that's better suited um, to to working um, with them. So, you know, if you've got freelancers, you know, that are similar to what you do but might be better suited, it's not necessarily a bad feeling as though they're a bad person or something. It's just that mm, they might take me down a rabbit war and I don't necessarily want to be a part of in terms of it might be a two-day-a-week thing and I don't have that time or um, that sort of thing. So making sure that you're... Um, you know, being strategic about the work that you say yes to and, and also no to is really important. And, and have you, has your approach to saying no changed as you've become, I guess, perhaps more experienced and more confident in your own ability and maybe more at peace with the type of work that you do want? Was it different in the early days for you, saying no? Um, I probably never said no in the early days. I was really, really hungry for work and um, really... Uh, I really wanted to prove that the, I could make this work. So I did say yes. And I was doing really well and churning it out and, um, you know, happy with that. But I've really got to the point, as I said, that I sort of do say no now. And, um, yeah, I guess the approach hasn't really changed. Sometimes I spend some time on a call and then I'll email the client and just say, look, I've had a think and I've looked at my um, calendar and I, I can't really commit to that so you can you can do it that way and also just say but I've got this really great here's three people I think are really great for this work um, and also the other thing the other side of that is that the people you're referring work to it always comes back to you you know if you're generous with that 
um, they'll be generous back to you as well and give you the kind of work that's um, more up your alley as well. So it's really important to have that kind of connection with other freelancers. How much of, of being a better freelancer is, how much of a part of that is upskilling and learning and self-improvement? Oh, it's everything really. I mean, it's sort of accepting that you're um, at a stage where you need to sort of, you know, change it up and improve is really vital. A lot of freelancers sort of, I find, you know, can't figure out why they're not able to get found for work they're not getting those inquiries consistently coming in and you take a look at their website or you know their branding out there in in the world and it's it's from a website from 2010 they've got a hotmail address or something you just think you know you've because there's so many more freelancers entering the market you've really got to look the part if you're going to be wanting to work at that next level so you know the website your website's important and your email address is important and your signature on your email is important. This is how we communicate 99% of the time with our clients. Certainly a lot of freelancers work in offices as well and there's that face-to-face -face side of things. Um, but, you know, making sure that you look the part on email is really important and, and socials as well. So, um, Sorry, did I answer your question there? Yeah, well, I guess obviously uh, Im improving your online presence is something that we've covered. Uh, yeah. I was thinking more along the lines of perhaps learning new skills that might be yeah. formally, informally, you know, qualifications, yeah. uh, you know, keeping up to date with modern, uh, you know, technology yeah. and, uh, and that kind of thing. I I mean, do, you, yeah. do, you, do you spend much time on that sort of aspect of self-improvement for yourself? Yeah. Years and years ago when I started, I went to lots of sessions about freelancing and learnt about it. And I would fly myself and tax deduction, you know, and learn about the nuts and bolts stuff. So um, that was really important for me in the early days. And now the way I do it is I take myself out for lunch with my husband, who's my accountant um, and my biggest champion. And... We book in a really beautiful lunch and we stay there for four hours um, or so. So we we just really sort of celebrate the year of freelancing and what it's brought us as a family. Um, we take our my laptop and hotspot to look up things during the chat. Jason, my husband, prepares all my financials and he's an accountant. So he, he sort of breaks down my earnings by clients so I can see my biggest clients. Um, we chat through the best projects that I've worked on over the course of the year. We also make sure we look at my biggest hassles, the, big, the hardest part of the year, trips that I've taken and whether I enjoyed it or not, or whether that next year I don't want to travel or I do. Or, um, and we break down my earnings. So I charge by the hour, by the word, by the project. And we looked at, look at um, percentages of earnings. So we pie graph it. We're very kind of, we really do it he does a really great job and shows me and I've had three glasses of wine. I'm like, Oh, that looks great <laughs> by then. And my happiness levels because of freelancing really does grow every year. I'm earning more, you know, cause I'm charging more. I'm really thinking through, you know, how to do things quicker and better. So I don't necessarily sign up for courses. Um, I just really, I think talking it through with someone that really gets it and that's been your advocate for as long as my husband has been and um, cheers me on from the sidelines, I think that's really important just to have someone that you can really kind of chat it through with. And, yeah, that's how I do I call it annual planning session um, and it's fabulous. And I wrote a blog about it on the Freelance Collective if anyone wants to look that up and it actually maps out um, th those processes and what we look at. If, yeah, yeah. feel free to share the link. We've had a comment in, in chat uh, from somebody who's preferred to remain anonymous who says, uh, your husband sounds like a legend. Um, so great. Well, look, that's great insight. I mean, it sounds like that what you're saying is, is you know, for some people that there might be times in your career where formal learning is the go and maybe yeah. doing a course or a certificate might help you get to that next level. But also having uh, a support network of some kind a trusted advisor whether that's a husband or, or, or a partner or not um you know it is, is also good and 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 uh, really it also sounds like there's a huge amount of fairly brutal honesty about yeah. that discussion even even if it is lubricated by a couple of glasses <laughs> of wine it yeah. sounds like that's the time where you have to sit down and say okay well you know no bull 
Yeah. Uh, you know, let, let, let's really think about what do I like? What don't I like? What do I want to do more of? What do I want to do less of? And that helps you plan your business going forward. Yeah. As a freelancer, I think everybody will know mm. that you're not trading on a brand or you're, you are your brand. You yeah. know, there's no, often no shiny logo or, or anything else. And you're responsible for, for everything. Um, how do you build and protect your reputation, Nina? Yeah, it's, um, it's really first and foremost about making sure that you really do a great job every single time because clients speak to each other. Um, so if you don't deliver on a project or you go silent um, on a client for some reason for a day or, um, you know, that's going to spread. That, that's going to spread around really quickly. And, um, you know, you, you, you've really got to, first of, all, first of all, make sure you deliver at least what you said you're going to deliver. But I always try and just give a little bit more, whatever that might be. Um, you know, whether that's meta descriptions or um, a photo or just a little bit more. And just every single time um, my clients email me, I'm, I'm going to write on it. Like I'm absolutely answering the email. Like they come up on my computer. I'm here five days a week and I, I'm answering it straight away. So they, they feel as I'm almost there. So that's all part of sort of reputation building as well. Um, yeah, you kind of, you've, you've got to obviously, we've talked about branding. I actually hire someone to help me with my branding um, and spend a bit of money on my website. I, I don't, build it myself or any of that stuff. I, I actually spend a few grand on um, those things, you know, as I, as I need to. And outsourcing those things is really important. Um, so, you know, accepting what you're good at and what you're not, because if you're not great at building a website, you shouldn't be doing it. And it's your reputation at the end of the day. So you want to make sure you, you look the part. Um, you know, if, if people are posting things about your work on LinkedIn, sometimes your clients might be posting things out there on social media. Respond, take the time to respond. You've got to be across these things. Make sure you comment. Thank them for the work. Um, those sorts of things. It all builds into um, your reputation. So, you know, make sure you've obviously got really great photography um, out there in the world. If you're being, you know, you've got your photo attached to your work or your website um, and that you update your logo. Um, I had a logo that I cringe at now when I first started out and um, it was the obligatory typewriter logo that a lot of, a lot have. And I was, yeah, I got rid of that. It just wasn't, it didn't feel like what I was doing anymore. So I changed it. It's, it's a great logo. It's, I know that it, there's a lot of them out there, but for me, I just it wasn't quite representative of what I was offering anymore in terms of service, so um, I changed it. And, and making sure you reassess and reevaluate everything all the time, like you know, at least every twelve months, just looking at it again and going, "Oh, I'm not putting my best foot forward here. I need to spend the money to actually earn an income." So, you know, you've got to be the marketing. You've got to be um, in charge of that stuff and. Being around other people, like-minded freelancers, is really important. If you, you know, if you've got yourself up on, um, obviously the freelance collective, I'm going to say, but you know, it's part of your reputation to actually have, you know, a vetted community around you. So those things are really important. Uh, I make sure I know what I'm earning in advance the day before that day, and I, if I've got a project, I, I actually allot an amount of time. Usually I do fall short because I'm a bit of a perfectionist. So I'll say I've got two days for this project or three days for this project, whatever it might be. And then I've always built in a buffer so that I'm working on that project well, well, well before it's due, like a week. And then I, and then if a kid gets sick or, you know, something happens in life as it does, I'm not doing the whole kind of, oh, I can't meet my deadline thing, which, you know, it's just not a, it's just not acceptable at all at this kind of you need to plan stuff better than that I would suggest um, you know you've really got to plan it out and and know what your time's worth so that if you want to be earning 150 an hour um, you you go okay well that I've quoted on the project this so I need I need to actually get it completed within this time 
And then I always read stuff, I call it with fresh eyes. So I never file, I put it away, go to sleep, get up, and then I read it again and re-edit it again. Um, so, you know, those sorts of things are really important if you want to get to that kind of next level with things. Funnily enough, uh, a couple of months ago when we spoke to Rachel Smith, who I'm sure you know, yeah. the she, she also made the point exactly the same about um, making sure that you've got a buffer yeah. Uh, use the same example. So if my kids get sick or I need to go and pick them up from childcare or whatever it is, it was all, it was almost exactly the same. So uh, great to see that there's a consistency from, uh, from the freelance legends that we're talking to. So what we might do now, Nina, uh, given that it's, uh, we're, we're coming up to time, we do have quite a few questions uh, that have come through. And um, so uh, the first one uh, is from Stu, who asked, do you have any music production or composition freelancers on, in the Freelance Collective? Um, we've had a couple and uh, we are always open to expanding um, the categories that we have listed. So it's worth getting in touch. Usually what we're doing is actually asking and sometimes within our community, people are like, this is exactly who my client needs. Yes, let's add that category. So we kind of decide as a collective whether or not to add a category. Um, and we have added a couple because of inquiries. So please get in touch. So maybe there's a chance to corner the market there for music professionals in the collective stew. Um, now we've got quite a big question from Pradeep actually in the, in the Q and A module, and I might just try and, and, and give you a, a synopsis. So it sounds to me like uh, Pradeep has taken a, a shift from quoting for a whole project to a more sort of agile approach and quoting more based on deliverables. But it sounds like in the type of work that he does, that it could be halfway through the project that the deliverables and the outcomes might change just through a natural iteration of, of how the project goes. Mm. Um, and he thinks that, it, that there's an opportunity that that may come back to bite him if things don't go right. Um, yeah. And he asks, what is a good approach to tell a client to put these changes in writing without me constantly telling them to, to without me constantly having to ask them to do it so yeah. I guess that's around changes in scope and and managing that how, how what advice would you have for I had, I had the same thing recently I had a 6,000 word project that was you know lots of research and a, writing a white paper that turned into 10,000 words and um, you know twice as long in terms of time and you've got to manage that stuff within your business so so when I do a quote um, and I, I do up a quote I'm very specific about what that um, fee is for and then anything outside of that um, obviously is, is going to, uh, you know, be an extra cost. So um, being able to sort of stand up and, and not be pushed over and say to your client because they've hired you um, based on your skills, so they, they're going to want you to stand up and say, hey, you know, this is outside of scope. Um, I've actually, so take the time, maybe map it out. I've dot pointed um, you know, the extra time allowed and I reckon it'll be about this in terms of extra dollars or just in an email even as a starting point and then you can look at contracting it um, once they've agreed on email, for example. So, um, yeah, just just being really kind of across that and going back to the quote that you provided and looking if it's outside of scope or whether or not you've actually, in fact, perhaps not allowed for, um, you know, it, misinterpreted what they wanted and not quoted quite right. You've got to kind of decide which which of those two it is. Um, and just, yeah, pointing it out. It's it's just all part of it. You've got to kind of stand up for yourself if, if things are getting outside of scope. So another question here from Sharon. Uh, Nina, how do you approach LinkedIn self-branding? Do you focus on the work you have done or do you do the thought lead or do you take the thought leader approach? I focus on the work I've done and I share that um, because I think it's it's kind of social proof um, and it will help you attract the kind of work you want. I'm I'm conscious I'm careful about what's what sort of work I share. There's certainly work I've done that I wouldn't share because I don't feel as though it reflects the the usual stuff I do. Um, so I I don't I I have done like articles and things in the past, but. I ain't got time for writing more articles. <laughs> so I just share the ones I've done and um, ask for testimonials and that, then that sort of thing. Um, now, a, a branding question from Sharon, um, and she wants to know more about how you align your brand with your offerings how do, and, and, and actually uh, around uh, trading uh, under your name versus a business name. Do you have a, a, 
a, a view on, on, you know, which works best or? This is, this is such an interesting one and it's something that, you know, a lot of people I work with have, we've discussed and it really, de- it really depends. Like for me, because most of my work is under my name, um, it made sense to, to not try and call myself Blue Zebra or something like that. Um, but, you know, lots of freelancers that are more kind of established small businesses, you know, and, and kind of put themselves forward in that light, uh, trade under a business name and it works really well for them. They might kind of work with a couple of freelancers here and there that they hire as, as the work kind of gets too much for them to handle. Um, and that, that works really well for them. So it just depends. The last question is for Tom. Uh, and this is actually a great one uh, that, that that deals with, you know, again, client management. Yeah. Um, how do you deal with clients who aren't 100% convinced of the value of your service? I'm a copywriter and I had a client recently, uh, perhaps facetiously, he says, that say he didn't consider a, a, a word and therefore I shouldn't add it to the word count. What are your thoughts on that? Oh, that's, no, freelancers right there. Um <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so, what's the ha- what's the question? Can you ask the question again so I can answer it? So I yeah. think this is um, how do you deal with clients that aren't one hundred percent convinced of the value of your service? Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't. I was I was asked to do a writing sample last week. Um, I refused. I, it was a really big project for me. Um, it was exactly who I want to work with. And the quote that I sent in is huge, but I'm not, do, I'm not doing their free sample. I literally have so much proof of my work out there um, that I said no. And what they came back with was, oh, well, we'll pay you for the sample. So I got paid for the sample um, because they're using that to go to their client, um, who's a big bank, and say, look, give us the job. So, you know, it's about really having that social proof out there in the right places in the first place. Um, And then I don't think you really need to prove yourself. Maybe you might, if it's a big project that you're quoting on, um, you might want to go in and meet with them if if that's a a good idea or offer it for, like Calendly is a really great way to have clients book your time. So maybe you can set that up and they can book in for a half an hour chat with you and they can decide that way. you know, you can send them some samples of your work that you've done in the same space. Certainly no problem doing that. Um, when I'm asked to sort of send samples of my work or something like that, I literally just spend 10 minutes writing that email and sending my samples. I don't, like, craft things for an hour because that's my work day. Like, you don't want to cut into that time. You really need to, you know, select some samples, have a really good kind of filing system on your computer, whatever that might be, and send it off and then wait. And if you don't get it, seriously, there are more fish in the sea. If you realise that and um, understand that, you know, there's plenty of fish in the sea when it comes to clients, if they don't want to work with you, they're not your peeps. Now, we are at time. However, there is one more question that has come in. Okay. Uh, are you okay for one more question, yeah. Nina? Okay. So this is from Michelle, uh, and again, a a relatively long question. Uh, I'm a journalist now working in copywriting and social media. My biggest challenge is most of my work is ghostwritten. I've been silently subcontracted by agencies to write articles for major multinationals that don't even know I exist. I've been running social media pages for brands with 2 million plus followers, and I'm not allowed to name them, and the agencies don't want to risk their clients finding out, so I can't even drop the name to other agencies, and they won't provide testimonials. It's really frustrating because my portfolio would be amazing if I could show it, but I can't. That is really tough. I would have thought that if you go back over the last two or three years, there would have to be half a dozen that would let you do that like maybe you don't put put those clients on your website but if you do up a, a pdf thing or whatever it is that you actually send out to new potentials so that it's not in the public domain but you're still promoting the work you've done surely you'd be able to find half a dozen that would let you do that um outside of that if they won't allow you to use it for your own self-promotion in that way um gee that is tough i guess you know, there are ways to describe what you do, like 
out there in, um, you know, you've worked for ASX listed brands, um, you know, those sorts of things. There are a lot of great profiles out there that read like that and that's another way to do it. You don't necessarily, you can say you work with the top tier banks or the, you know, um, those sorts of things. So maybe describing the companies that you work for um, and sometimes I guess not naming who you work for but describing them in those ways shows that you're also quite loyal and that you've respected their boundaries and um, that can be really important as well. So if you can't do those things and you, ha you have to name them in that way, you have to describe them in that way, it's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, maybe you can show some of the campaigns and actually black out, blank out their name or, or something like that. You have to be a bit creative, but there, there is a way around it, I'm sure. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, look, Nina, thank you. That, that's great insight. Um, and I'd like to thank you for taking the time uh, to okay. share that, that with us today.